What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access, and today we're joined by Delta Funky Homo Sapien. What's happening, y'all? Thank you for coming through, sir. So, Del, man, you have a long story career, and you've worked with some of the biggest artists in music history, and I wanted to take it back all the way to the back to when you were first getting started and, and working with Cube, getting down with I Wish My Brother George Were Here. So with that, um, you had obviously been writing before that with Cube as part of the lynch mob. Yeah. So how did you, not being from Southern California, fit in when you started writing with those guys? Um, it wasn't hard for me because, for one, the stuff that I was kind of writing, oh, well, as far as writing is concerned, mm -hmm. it was more for Yo-Yo, you know what I'm saying, or maybe for Cube at times. Okay. So it wasn't too hard to switch to that because it's not, like, too crazy, you know what I'm saying? It's, alike enough, you know. <laughs> as far as how they are, I was always in LA anyway. Okay. You know what I mean? Like my whole family on my mom's side on my mom's side is from LA. Well they from the South, but you know, everybody migrated to LA. Right, right. You know what I mean? So I'm out there like every summer. That's how I know Q, you know what I mean? Because I'm out there like every summer. He was one of my favorites that I used to like and go visit, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. we was kind of close in age. Kind of had the same kind of, you know, uh, likes or dislikes or what have you. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean. So how did it come to where you started writing for Yo-Yo? It just kind of slid into there like that. Like it just was an opportunity. And he, it's, it's something that he offered for me to keep me kind of get my feet wet in the industry. You know what I mean? Okay. That's what I figure. You know what I'm saying? Give me something to do while I'm waiting to put out my own stuff. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Put, put a little bread in my pocket, you know what I'm saying? Because obviously they don't need nobody to write for them, but like, right. you know, they just let him, let him do something so we can see what it is, you know? And then what did you find is, was it different as your career has progressed writing for a woman or writing a female perspective or how did that work? N n well, it wasn't hard for me because I could, for one, I kind of knew her, you know what I mean? Okay. For two, I just put my mind into, you know, that situation. I could do that, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm around women a lot, you know what I'm saying? I grew up around a lot of women, you know what I'm saying? A lot of girls I used to have as friends, so. I mean, friends, for real, like I talked to them about stuff and <laughs> I'd know things that they thought about it, and you know what I mean? Like, right. not trying to chase booty or nothing, just on a platonic right. level, so. I just felt like I kind of understood certain things. Okay. But that goes for even with Cube too, you know what I'm saying? Cube is in a different environment and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, anything you toss to me, I could kind of imagine. I, I, I feel like that's one of my, one of my- Gifts. Uh, I don't want to know if I say gifts or a trait. Okay. You know what I'm saying, of my personality. I'm able to relate to people. Yeah, and I think that's been one of the defining things with your career is being able to showcase your diversity with the different type of artists you work with, but also like the subject matter, the eras, the types of music. So what do you think it was as a kid or as you developed as a person and as a songwriter that's enabled you to do such disparate things? I, that's just my personality, I guess. A lot of this stuff, you know, you don't really plan these things. You kind of just fall into these things by chance when the opportunity arises. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of it, I guess, over time, people started to like my work, you know what I'm saying, or like working with me. So a lot of times I might get requested, you know what I mean, just off of that. You know, I build a reputation and people kind of just go with that. Okay, let's work with him. We heard that he's easy to work with or he's cool or mm -hmm. they start to peep my repertoire. Oh, okay, he probably could do this. Maybe such and such wouldn't be able to handle it, but Dell probably could handle it, you know what I mean? So that, that's how a lot of it works out, you know. Hmm. But I feel like I'm just good at just, you know, throw me, put me with uh, with uh, Prince Paul mm -hmm. and I could get with what Prince Paul is doing. I'm not gonna try to disturb what he got to do on the production tip. I like Prince Paul for what he do. I'm sure that whatever he do gonna be dope. I ain't gonna complain about it too much. I'll fit whatever I'm doing to what he doing. So that's just the way I work. And do you think that comes from maybe getting in the game initially as a writer first, as opposed to an artist to where you had to like carve yourself out like that? Nah, because I was an artist really before. Like okay. I, I was writing for Q, but I had already been doing stuff for a, a long while. Like I've been rapping probably since like fourth, fifth grade. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like trying to make little tapes and you know what I'm saying? Right. It might have been over LL Cool J, Rock the Bells or whatever, but now... It still was that, 
But you, you know, did it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, and I let people hear, like, so around town and stuff, people are already starting to know me. Mm-hmm. I've already been known for making stuff. So I already kind of had my own identity anyway. Like, actually, once I got with Cube, they kind of had to, like, shape it a little bit because I was way all over here. Like, I was off the hood. So what did they shape? They had to take some of the illness out of it. You know what I mean? Because it was just too crazy. At the time, I didn't really understand. I'm like, why? But now I get it. Like, the average person, you can't just be beating them over the head with so much ill shit it's gonna be like okay okay mm-hmm. we get it you know what i mean like it's too much you know for somebody like me that's a head i'm like yeah the iller the better you well, know give me I mean? an example like what was going on i mean okay i had a song called uh concrete trampoline <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying okay that's it like you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like but why you feel me like now the average person will probably see that title and be like what the fuck is this shit about right like even though you could kind of imagine and kind of think what it could be they wouldn't find that funny probably they'd probably be like this is stupid as hell hmm. you mean you know what i mean like i can't relate to it this is imaginary mm-hmm. you know what i mean so he had he was just like man think about it like if you're talking to somebody out here on the block so then how <laughs> that being said then with the album, though, you still do have a lot of stuff um, on there. Like, Mr. Davalina, just the name. Like, how did that conversation go to where they're saying no to Concrete Trampoline, but Mr. Davalina, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like, how did that work? Well, for one, I guess because it was catchy. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I'm talking about something. You know what I mean? Obviously, I'm talking about some guy or some situation. Situation, right. It ain't just cryptic-ass battle raps basically because that's basically what i did that's all i cared about mm-hmm. was skills you know what i mean right but that was you know that was a story it kind of had a little bounce to it like a song i approached it like a real song a, a real song right right you know what i mean like i wasn't thinking about being the hardest rapper or nothing i tried to make a song with that mm-hmm. so that's probably why that worked mm-hmm. it was ill yeah it's kind of crazy but dabalina came from the monkeys so they was already kind of ill too, so, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. And then I also think on the album, you had so many amazing concepts and things like with the Rapid Transit, with Dark Skin Girls. So for you, what made those things that were very unusual at the time to rap about something that you wanted to embrace and do songs and explore on those levels? Um, man, I'm trying to think, were, were, were they things that was really not addressed or talked about or is that just, I think it was just my take on it, you know okay. what I mean? Like something like Dark Skin Girls, mm-hmm. that was about like something like School Days was kind of based on. True. You know what I'm saying? The, the concept, but I just didn't have no nicer way, I guess, at the time to address it mm-hmm. than just be like sarcastic. You know what I mean? Right, right. Just trying to get on people's nerves or whatever. Gotcha. So that that's how that came out. Um, some of them just was like was tossed out by uh by by a uh, pool. Okay. Like money for sex. He had the beat, and he was like, "Hey, Dale, hey, I got this track called Money for Sex. You want to try to do something to it?" And then he play it, Money for Sex, ring it up, tling. When I heard the tling, I was like, "Okay, okay." <laughs> And then I, you know, I just went to the hotel where I was staying at that night, wrote it, came back to the studio. Let's go. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We just worked real good like that. So some of it, I would say a lot of it just be tossed to me like a concept. Do it about this. Okay. Gotcha. You know what I mean? But if you, you left it up to me, it would just be eating them seeds or whatever, the whole. So is that with no need for alarm? How did that? shape how did your experience on which my brother george was here shape the next phase of your career you know what now that i look back what it really was was the peer pressure around me from people i went to school with that's what kind of made me switch and just be like okay i'm going this way because hmm. everybody is was probably jealous you know what i'm saying that i had a record out or whatever so they was like saying my record was fake i sold out this is pop this ain't this ain't what we heard you do before you came out you know i'm known for something else you know what i mean mm-hmm. so that just like discouraged me and uh, you know sent me into a depression basically hmm. 
And I'm like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I got to prove to people what I could really do. And that's why I went so hard with no need for alarm and just went the way over here. Right, right. I could rap. I could rap for real. I'm hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like that's looking back now, that's that's what it was. Mm -hmm. At the time, though, I couldn't have told you that. I just felt bad for some reason. And I think I was overseas, like in Europe or something, and just kind of thinking, reflecting. And then it just hit me like, that's why I was tripping. Cause it, oh, like it just seemed stupid at that point. Like I was tripping off them. They was hating actually. And then what about sonically? Because obviously, as your career has evolved too, you've you know worked over so many different types of beats and with so many different genres. Moving away from you know working with DJ Pooh, for instance, to to move in more with the Hieroglyphics crew. How do you think that shaped your artistry? Well, I was already working with Hyro since the beginning. You know, A plus and Tajay. Uh, Sir Jinx just threw a picture up online of me, um, A plus and a uh, Tajay way back when, way back then. You okay. know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm just looking at the picture like, wow, we really been doing it for this long. I think Tajay had a box cut, a gold chain on. Oh, you feel me? Like it was just looking crazy. Like wow, that was a real blast from the past. So like. Working with them wasn't nothing new. I'm more like trying to introduce them to the world. Okay. And just introduce the whole thing that we got. Right. You only got a piece of it with me. Mm -hmm. But when they came out, then the whole movement you got to see. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was only a, like a little bit with me that, that, that could be funneled through whatever was my chance to get out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I had to kind of comply it at some point. But don't get me wrong though, everything that went on there I enjoyed. Like, funk is my shit, mm -hmm. to the point where I studied funk, and now I could play probably all that shit that was sampled on that record at this point. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, that, all that shit was me too. But I could do other shit too, I'm into other shit too. So that's why the second album came out the way that it came, because I felt like I didn't have enough of that sound on the first album. First album more polished, and I'm not really like that. I like raw shit. You know what I mean? That's what attracted me to hip hop in the first place. Was it wasn't glossy? It wasn't all this perfection. Like right. it was rough. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And then um, one of the other things that I always thought was intriguing was with Judgment Night, how that kind of like launched to me like a whole new genre of music. That soundtrack. So do you think that being on there like really shaped how people perceived you or opened you up in a way? I'll say this, it, it hella helped me see different things as far as music is concerned. That, hmm. that, that probably has a big, uh, that's probably a, one of the reasons why I started studying music theory hmm. eventually. It's from talking with Jay Maskus and doing that shit. Because when we was in the studio doing that, the rest of the band wasn't doing shit. They was in the other room playing pool or some shit. They never even acknowledged us damn near. So Jay Masters played everything on that song, except for like the 808 kick. Hmm. You know what I mean? But everything in that he played. So I'm just sitting back like, damn, he don't even need these fools. Like, he the mastermind. Right. So that just like was amazing me in itself. Hmm. But also I was talking to him about music and stuff and he was generally interested in like, you know, what's hip hop about and he didn't really fuck with it like that. He fucked with me, you know, they asked him what rapper would you like to fuck with and he had heard of me. Mm -hmm. So he's like, okay, I'll fuck with Dale. And so that's how they even set that up. But mm -hmm. once we started talking, like we just learned from each other, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was like real tight. You know what I mean? Like I learned a lot from just talking to him because I wasn't on that level of music yet. You feel me? So okay. he just opened my mind up hella more. And then, obviously, later, uh, or you did have, you know, the dissolution with Electra, and then with the rest of the camp with Jive. How do you think, or what made you guys really push with the internet, and how do you think that impacted everything else that ended up happening? Like I said, you know, stuff really just kind of fall into place. Like mm. that was an opportunity. So we just went with it. It was either that or what, what, what was we gonna do? Really with the internet, this cat named Stinky, he already had a hieroglyphic site. I wasn't even on the internet at that point. Like mm -hmm. that was too early for me. But Tajay, he was on the internet and so he knew a Stinky and then that's how that started working. He got with Stinky was like, let's make this an official 
you know, website. Mm -hmm. Like, fuck with Hyro for real, and then that's how it developed into, you know, where it's at now. Right. So it just was an opportunity that kind of just arose. But um, as far as I just want to say before a lecturer, like, I don't have no problem with a lecturer at all. Like, mm -hmm. Like what it is, what it is. Like I felt, I feel like I was kind of responsible in some ways for us having to part ways because I wasn't being the most agreeable person to work with, at, along with whatever else was happening too. Okay, you know what I mean? Like they uh, put it this way: Sylvia Rome flew out to the Bay to talk to me. That's huge. Like at the time, I didn't even know how huge that was. Right, Who right. you think she really doing that for? So she obviously must have really felt me. But she was like, you know, she'd ask me questions like, you want to work with this producer, maybe this producer? And I'm like, nah, I could do what they're doing. Why would I want to? It's like, I'm not asking you that, dude. Like, right. they make records that sell is what I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to keep you on the damn label. You know what I'm saying? I'm not asking you how great you think you are. So, you know, it just was like, okay, he's not going to move or whatever. But also, they was just shifting their whole shit over there. You know what I'm saying? Everything was switching around, changing. Uh, you know, taking shit out, moving shit in. It was just a brand new house. So Dante was gone, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it is. It, dummies. It, what's that? Stimulated dummies. Yeah, I mean, D Dante's the dude, though. Like, he, he's like, he's like a big brother to me, you know what I'm saying? He looked out a lot in them days, you know what I mean? Like, he signed me because he really felt something about it. Like, it wasn't just, okay, some money or something. Like, we, we was kicking it out there, you know what I'm saying? I, he gave me the keys to his apartment when I was out there, you know what I'm saying? You could just right. come and go as you please, you feel me? So, obviously, working with you, and then he was working with Brand Nubian, working with KMD, and... Um, yeah, I know Doom, too. Like, I used to fuck with Doom, too. Yeah. Constipated Monkeys, too, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Uh, Curious, you know what I'm saying? Uptown. I used to be up there a lot, actually, with Curious. So, what what do you think made that group of artists, including yourself, so special and stand out in a way? We was just bugged out, man. Like, really, to tell you the truth, we kind of was all, all on that kind of shit. Like, mm -hmm. just kind of was just bugged out, you know what I'm saying? Like, we was just a trip. Mm -hmm. We was kids, though, too, you know what I mean? But I guess we wasn't ashamed to be ourselves and do things the way we wanted to do them. Mm -hmm. Like, you could see that with the way we dressed the... To me, that's kind of what hip hop was about, to tell you the truth. You know what I mean? Right. Like, kind of just be yourself. You just, you just, just make it work for you. You know what I mean? So I think that's what separated us. But I feel like everybody at that time kind of had their own little way or their own little twist on it too. So you know, that's that's especially Doom. But we kind of grew up on the same type of shit too. I remember when I was at Curious House and I seen Doom and um, Sub Rock was there too. And they was like kind of like cutting sort of on a record player, a ultra magnetic record. And I'm like, damn, y'all fuck with ultra magnetic? And they was like, oh, hell yeah, ultra's the shit. And I'm like, oh, okay, see, I, I should have known. You know what I'm saying? Like in my head, I'm like, I should have known. That's why they, you know what I mean? That's why they're on what they're on. Yeah, you feel me? Like we kind of just kind of like, you know, melded together off of that alone. You know what I mean? They was working on Black Bastards at the time, actually. Okay. Yeah, that was a, that was a great... It's, it's interesting when you look back because a lot of the labels <clears throat> had these kind of collection of artists that may not have seemed that they were similar but kind of fit in a somewhat of a same umbrella. And obviously Dante Ross being kind of a common thread there and then later he did great work with ODB and others. Mm -hmm. But, but um, all that to be said, I think it's, it's interesting too as your career evolved with those type of experiences that you were able to get bigger working kind of outside what people knew you for, um, and re especially initially and as your career progressed. So why, why do you think when you've branched out or you've done things that are a little more unconventional in the rap world that you've gotten embraced outside of rap so much? I mean, uh, you just said it, really. Like, it's outside of the rap world, so. <laughs> yeah, so people outside of rap, you might not even like rap. Mm -hmm. But you might listen to Gorillaz, you know what I'm saying? I think that's cool, you know what I mean? Or Deltron, you might not even, like people have told me they don't even really like rap, but when they heard that, oh, okay, this is what it could be, okay, I'll kind of fuck with this, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like different to people. Not like I'm trying to make something that's so much different from what, I, what the hip hop is, you know what I'm saying? That's not really my intent. 
but at this point, I kind of see like, okay, at this point, you could kind of make your own lane completely. Like you ain't even gotta be associated with hip hop. Cause to tell you the truth, a lot of people didn't uphold. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I upheld all the all the laws, all the rules. Got every damn book you could probably find on hip hop. Anything you interested in in hip hop, I probably got the shit. Mm -hmm. And I, I know a lot of people didn't do all that. They wasn't tripping off it that damn hard. You know what I'm saying? Like it was cool, but. You know, when it's when things change, it just change and fuck it or whatever. I don't know what money come in this situation, whatever. I just seen it like, okay, I didn't create this world where now it's where it's at. Like that wasn't part of my idea. Mm -hmm. That happened beyond my control. You know what I'm saying? I still got to deal with it though. So, but you know, you now you could kind of curve your own lane. You could do it the way you maybe that will turn into what Hurt did with hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like. Right. He wasn't trying to make no kind of wave or nothing. Like, that's what, that's what we doing. And then it just became this because of the um, inspiration that came from it. You know what I mean? Well, actually, it's kind of all kind of the same wave. If you look at it as black music, kind of, it's pretty much the same thing. But now, you technically, yes. But I'm saying, though, you know, that at this point, you got your space to make your total expression the way you want to do it. Right. You know? So now... Um since you've released so much material, how do you find new things to challenge yourself as a writer? Man, like I said, URL, basically. <laughs> like, hey, like I love them dudes because they really be getting down. Like, mm -hmm. And the thing that I started noticing about them cats that battle is they use more they use more types of wordplay than was used before. You know what I'm saying? Or in different ways. Like, I guess you always had double entendres a little bit. Mm -hmm. or like, but it was more about rhyming and how many, how many syllables you could rhyme, how much you could stuff into something, and vocabulary, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Metaphors, you know what I'm saying? Not, excuse me, not metaphors, similes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But it didn't really go beyond that. Now I'm looking at the battlers, I'm like, oh, okay, it's a whole, they might as well be comedians. In a lot of ways, right? You know what I'm saying? Because they're using the full gamut, setups, full setup. But let me ask you, since a lot of it, um, depending on what you're watching too, but you know, a lot of the this incarnation of battle rap doesn't have beats. Yeah, but when did when did you ever battle and there was beats? I don't remember battling. It was ever a beat unless somebody was, <laughs> right? Or maybe doing the beatbox, maybe. But you out on the street. So, there ain't no beat, you know what I'm saying? So really, they kept, they kept it to the rawest form. Like if you was really in the back of the uh, library or something battling, or in the you know wherever you at, but you ain't yard, yeah, you ain't nowhere with no PA system, <laughs> with no beat nowhere. Right. Like you doing it just with with nothing. Really, your vocals is the beat. Well, how you spit it got the rhythm that make it the beat. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think it's great. Mm -hmm. It's just focused on the lyrics, really. Well, it's focused on the rhythm of it, too, because different cats got their own rhythm or don't. That's, that's kind of how you see, okay, dude is tight, dude is kind of what it, just talking. Right, right. You know what I mean? But URL got, that's like the NBA of the shit, basically. Like, you want to join their team. Like, you want to, you, you'll be dreaming about being with <laughs> URL, you feel me? Right, right. But that's tight though. But you know, there's grind time out in the bay too. You know what I'm saying? And that kind of was first. So I'm seeing this on video before really seeing Smack and all them. I seen Smack with the DVDs and stuff. Right, right. But you would see like the Blaze battles. Remember the Blaze battle? Absolutely. Man, um, dude. I was just looking at one of my concert tickets. So I went to one of those. Oh, for real? Yeah. With the one with Shells? Yeah. Shells used to be raw, dude. Like. Yep. Back, uh, back in the day. Yeah, like he was super raw, actually. I think I seen a, uh, damn, somebody. Okay, so, well, you get what I'm saying, though, man. Yeah. In this era, I loved what they did, too, business-wise, too, and took it from what it was and actually made it an industry into its own that's kind of popping now. Mm -hmm. I'm just intrigued by it. Like, I listen to Beasley as the dude that kind of worked the business and shit over there. Mm -hmm. So I... Anytime Beasley is talking, I just listen to him because he always spitting some game. You feel me? 
And I'm just interested in how he just worked all of this because people was like, whatever, whatever. And then next thing you turn around, full trailers, like graphics. Like, I'm like, damn, this is like some real shit. Now this shit be looking like it's a TV show straight up. Like, <laughs> damn, like this shit could be on TV. But it's my content that I want to hear. So you know? all that to be said, how, what are you working on? And is this inspiring you in any way to what you're working on now? I mean, it just inspired me to work that into my lyrics, the same as it did before. Mm -hmm. Only like it'd be on record. Well, that, that's why I started rapping because of that energy. Gotcha. Be like, damn, this fool really said that. Right, right. Like, did he really said that? Like, just saying some crazy shit. Now they say even crazier shit that got content. Now it's more about content. It ain't really about stacking hella syllables and shit like that's the pinnacle, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Or just using hella vocabulary. It's more about content and how well you can surprise somebody with what you're about to say. Right. You know, so I'm like, okay, this is tight because that's kind of the direction that I was moving anyway. I wanted to get less complex as far as like, you know, I wanted to be more concise with what I'm saying. Gotcha. And I just felt like that would help me remember my shit well okay if you could help if, that, if you could remember it then people listening to it would probably be able to remember it too you know True. it would just make more memorable lyrics so that was the direction i was going anyway and then they i started noticing this about them then i started looking at the humor because i got books about humor anyway because mm -hmm. you know wordplay is a big part of humor so i always was interested in it just never went that far because I, I don't know i just thought it wasn't for me maybe you know what i mean always interested in it so then I started looking into it, and then I'm starting to discover, oh, okay, okay, okay. Even if you rhyming, that already is humorous right there because it's wordplay mm -hmm. to a certain degree. But I feel like nowadays you're going to have to do more to humor people. Just rhyming ain't enough. Everybody could do that. Mm -hmm. Like that's basic level. Okay, so fucking what? That's not amazing to me. <laughs> so you got to have that content. You got to, I'm just like, humor? Yeah, you can't lose with humor. Like. You have more friends, more money, more opportunities, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's true, you know what I'm saying? Who's going to be mad at you if you can make them laugh? Well, there it is, y'all. Dada Funk and Homo Sapien, thank you for coming through. Unique access, I'm Soren Baker. Make sure you support. Right on, man. Thank you. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.